get started and people may be joining us, and I think you're all going to sit back here, Annie, I apologize. So oh, that's, that's fine. <laughs> but um, I'm going to let Jeff Moss, who is an associate professor in the Health Management Policy Program, do the introduction. So Jeff, you're on. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> Welcome. Everybody. A lot of you know Annie, but a lot of uh, not. So Annie um, is a graduate of our PhD in public health program in health policy. Has it been three or two years? Not quite two. Oh, okay. Like a year and a half, I think. Oh, okay. So, okay. So yeah. Point. All right. Great. So, um, um, Annie's, um, Annie worked with us on a number of important research projects in college. Um, her dissertation and subsequent research interests have been especially about um, rural health care and access to care. Um, and she now has a position um, as a uh, scientist and investigator at OCHIN, which is uh, an organization that maintains uh, electronic medical records and records and data from a variety of community health centers and organizations that serve underserved populations originally in Oregon, but now actually nationwide. So Andy's got this incredible sandbox in which to apply all the tools that uh, she learned here at OSU, and so we're looking forward to um, hearing about what you've been doing and um, you know, things at Ocean. Yeah. So thanks for having me. It's nice to be back here. Um, oops, what happened to our beginning slide? I I realize a lot of you might not really know what Ocean is and what Ocean does, so I kind of wanted to give a little bit of context and talk some about what Ocean, Ocean does before I talk about um, some of the research that we've been doing. Um, so, OCHEN is a nonprofit 501c3. Um, it was created in 2000 and it was developed um, to provide health information technology tools for community health centers. And it used to be an acronym. OCHEN used to stand for Oregon Community Health Information Network. It is no longer an acronym because, as Jeff mentioned, it is now nationwide, so we are simply OCHEN at this point. But um, we partner with over 500 organizations across the country in 47 states, um, 37 million patients. And as I will explain, not all of those patients are available within our research warehouse. Um, but the focus really is on the safety net clinics, small practices, and then um, starting to develop tools and support for critical access hospitals as well. Um, <clears throat> So OCHEN is really kind of a focused on health innovation and technology um, kind of within the te technology realm, looking at how we can better provide electronic health record, networking um, has also gotten into the realm of telehealth to provide telehealth services to the clinics that we serve. Um, research, and I will get more into that, in these kind of four main buckets that we really focus our research on, our research priorities. And then OCHEN also provides other services, professional services, such as billing. A lot of community health centers have a really hard time with staying up to date on their billing, and so we provide that as a service. We um, provide a lot of technical assistance and training for the centers that we serve. Um, teaching them how to use these tools to better serve the patients that are coming in. Um, so a little bit about OCHEN's history and kind of um, research at OCHEN. OCHEN is a pretty new organization. Um, as I mentioned, it started in 2000 within the state of Oregon. A few community health centers got together and decided collectively that they wanted to use um, an electronic health record tool and they decided upon EPIC as the tool that they would use. And EPIC usually provides its services to larger hospital health healthcare systems. And um, these community health centers went to EPIC and said, we would like to use your tool. And EPIC said, no way, you're way too small. <laughs> 
And so they got a few more organizations together and collectively went back to Epic. And Epic said, fine, we'll let you use it. Um, and started providing that to community health organizations um, and expanding beyond Oregon in about 2005. And then in 2007, the practice-based research network was started. So that's kind of when research within OCHIN started. Um, and in 2014, as part of the Affordable Care Act, PCORI funded um, several uh, clinical data research networks, and OCHIN was part of that um, research network, and since then has continued to grow. So as I mentioned, we provide um, support to over 500 organizations and kind of how they break out. Um, as far as kind of data and what's available for research purposes, that's the, the OCHIN EPIC organizations. Um, NextGen is a different EHR platform that we don't yet integrate into our research warehouse, but may at some point. Um, and then partner with researchers and other academic institutions or with the CDC, other research organizations across the country too. Um, so within kind of the epic population that OCHIN serves, they're um, pretty, pretty racially, ethnically diverse. Um, they're pretty representative of the um, kind of community health center population on a national level. Um, so the 56% that are at or below the federal poverty level, um, some of that's missing. We know that about 91% of patients that are served in community health centers are below 200% of the federal poverty level, and that most of the patients that we are serving kind of meet that threshold as well. Um, most all are on Medicaid, a large portion are uninsured patients, um, and most that are privately insured are likely insured through um, federal or state marketplaces, so not necessarily through an employer. And as far as kind of the patient data that we have available from kind of the beginning when OCHIN started until today, um, the number of member organizations has continued to grow. We, we don't have a sales department in OCHIN. Community health centers come to us by word of mouth um, or because Epic refers them to us if they're looking for kind of a solution or a, a way to kind of um, start using electronic health record data. Um, and as you can see, the patients that are part of our data warehouses continue to grow over time. Um, and then how that kind of breaks out specific to what's available within the OCHIN network by state. Um, I can't remember what um, kind of percentage of the community health centers in Oregon we cover, but I know it's most of them. Um, but then in other states, it's a smaller percent. And as far as kind of what the member organizations mean, so like Benton County is an organization, and within that, Benton County might have several clinics. Um, and then within those clinics, several departments, but not all departments within a clinic are using our, our services, and not all clinics within an organization are necessarily using our services, which can get quite complicated when you're trying to define clinics or trying to define departments and um, using for research purposes. Um, but we are currently, OCHIN is currently in 18 states. Um, so kind of within the OCHIN collaborative itself, um, OCHIN's focus is really on um, continuous learning and quality improvement. Um, we're a hub for our members and then we're also a participant in the larger healthcare arena. Um, so participating in those conversations and then trying to provide kind of that information down to the, um, the members that we're serving. Um, and we're a, we're a network of networks, so we have one instance of Epic. We have one license that we um, then kind of provide out to all of our um, to all of our member clinics, and um, 
where so which really allows us to gather data to use for healthcare kind of innovation and drive public health change within these organizations. Um, and within that, we really focus on these kind of different areas within clinical innovation, um, clinical informatics, practice improvement, um, and chronic disease kind of program management. And this allows um, improvement across our system by having kind of this, this innovation that happens in, within kind of a singular hub. Um, we have in-house a large team of clinicians um, and staff with a deep knowledge in healthcare in cl um, community health centers, which kind of from a research perspective is really useful because we are able to tap into that expertise and um, get information from them to help kind of make decisions or figure out what we should be looking for. Um, so in-house, the kind of disease-specific specialties that are available to us kind of cover a wide range of um, areas. And this kind of really mirrors our membership as well. Um, so additionally, we also have what's called um, clinical operation review committees or corks. And they're able to evaluate and recommend um, design or revision changes to the electronic health record system that is being provided within all these clinics um, or make um, changes to workflows or enhancements. So with coronavirus, they were able to very kind of quickly and collectively make changes within the electronic health record system to provide alerts if a clinic is seeing a patient that might have traveled to China or be showing certain signs or symptoms that they are able to um, kind of uh, update those recommendations from the CDC and WHO for those clinicians to be able to better serve their patients. And um, we also have what's called a, our PEP, our patient engagement panel. Um, it's an active work group of both caregivers and patients and they can provide feedback on studies. They are often kind of incorporated within the grants and the studies that we are developing. Um, they work with us on manuscripts. They can kind of help put the results in context. Um, and as we make changes or developments to the EHR tool, some of those are patient-facing um, changes, and so they're able to help provide feedback on those changes that we're making so that it's um, easier for patients to understand. And a lot of um, our PET members have some expertise in the areas that were um, in the topic that's being studied, but it kind of depends. Um, so that they are, I can, speaking from experience, they are a very useful tool because it's not a voice that we often get to have in research, but to be able to tap into the patient experience is really important. Um, so, I kind of mentioned we have one instance of EPIC within OCHEN, and what that means is kind of this one patient, one record. And regardless of what clinic that patient goes into, um, it is connected. So, uh, we, we are able to, from a research standpoint, utilize kind of that information from that patient no matter what clinic they go into. And then from a clinic perspective or provider perspective, they have access to that information on that patient um, regardless of where they were seen. Um, um, so it's, it's shared um, and maintained within OCHIN and um, available at any OCHIN clinic. Um, so last, uh, in 2019, last year, we had 35 um, active research projects, and I know um, we've had a number of new projects that have just been funded that we are um, collaborating on. Um, 21 publications, and some have gotten quite a bit of national attention. Um, 34 research partners, and I, I know these numbers are a little bit higher now, because as I said, we had some new projects that were just funded that were um, working in collaboration on. And um, part of 
in addition to just having access to this data, we also have um, a number of studies that are kind of implementation or tool build studies. So we can and do actively recruit the clinics that we serve to participate in our research. Um, and we have several um, tools, and I'll explain one study that I'm working on that, that can help better, hopefully help better serve the patients that are being seen in their um, clinics. And so we have 44 participating clinics and active research studies, and we compensate those clinics and we compensate the pro providers um, for participating in those studies with us. Um, so as I mentioned, we have these kind of four main buckets um, that are our research priority areas, and within those main buckets, um, we focus on these topic areas, but that's not to say we don't do research outside of these areas, but um, kind of in alignment with OCHIN's vision and mission, um, these, these have kind of been identified as kind of top research priorities for OCHIN. So extended beyond OCHIN and what OCHIN has available, I, I mentioned in 2014 as part of the Affordable Care Act um, PCORI funding, um, OCHIN was awarded um, one of 13 uh, clinical research network grants. Um, and OCHIN leads what's called the Advanced CRN. It's the uh, most comprehensive database available on healthcare outcomes of safety net populations in the United States. So it, it is in partnership with Health Choice Network out of Florida that similarly serves community health centers um, in a slightly different capacity than OCHIN does. Um, Fenway Health out of Boston that primarily serves LGBTQ populations, OHSU, and then the Robert Graham Center. And the Robert Graham Center um, combines geocoded community level data um, and, um, from a variety of different sources and we are able to link those to our patients. So a lot of the um, census level information or vitals kind of community level information on those patients and where they live. Um, so the advanced kind of data network is more vast than what's available in OCHIN, but it's also not, doesn't allow us to kind of go as deep as the OCHIN data network does. Um, and similar to, to kind of what's available within OCHIN, it's a very similar patient population that is very representative of, of kind of patients that are being seen in community health centers. Um, so PCORnet is um, an innovative um, kind of initiative that was funded initially by PCORI and then it became PCORnet. I think as of last week it is now going back under PCORI, mm -hmm. um, which is actually good for kind of longer term sustainability of these uh, clinical research networks. Um, and the mission is really to enable people to make informed healthcare de um, decisions. So the research that is being um, done within these kind of uh, clinical research networks is to help um, to help conduct research that's relevant to the needs of those patients being served. So as I mentioned, kind of what's available within a, um, the advance. Um, clinical research network is a slightly different from what's available within OCHIN's um, because OCHIN's data set and what's available within kind of research specific to OCHIN um, in part because the, um, the, the common data model that is required across all of these um, partners within our advanced data system is kind of not as it, it doesn't encompass everything that is available. And within OCHIN, we are able to kind of dig into the back end of EPIC, which has something like 18,000 tables to really get at what, kind of what might be going on. While we have one instance of EPIC, we are working across all of these kind of very separate health centers that may have very different workflows. 
and ways of kind of putting information in and sometimes trying to identify what is actually going on in each of those clinics isn't as easy as one might think because this clinic over here might um, kind of record that or have a different way of uh, capturing that information. Um, but the other thing that working with the OCHIN data allows us to do is we are able to um, link our data to other um, sources. So we have currently linked that to Medicaid claims um, for several projects and we get updated um, Medicaid data from Oregon on a quarterly basis. Um, we are in the process of linking with Medicare claims and APAC data and um, cancer registry vital statistics. So it kind of just depends on, it's a project by project <laughs> basis, but um, it is something that we have done and do kind of regularly for projects that we are working on that kind of provides some additional context. Um, so specific to kind of what what types of research is going on, um, I just picked some of the projects I've been involved in and I feel like they're kind of representative of the types of research that happens within OCHIN. Um, um, so the PPDAE study is actually a collection of grants. It is a collection of four grants um, that were all aimed at examining um, different aspects of Medicaid expansion and community health centers. Um, it is um, in partnership with the Department of Family Medicine at OHSU, and we utilized advanced data um, and linked Medicaid claims, data from the Robert Graham Center, and um, linked cancer registry data from Oregon, Washington, and California. So the four different grants were, one was looking kind of at just preventive service use and community health centers. Um, PACE was the um, first research project. It started in, it was um, started in 2015, but it was the first research project to use OCHIN's advanced data. Um, and so a lot of the learnings that have happened within OCHIN since then have kind of stemmed from this portfolio of research projects about kind of what, what we see in advance and what's available to us. Um, across all of our projects, um, we share a lot of information to try and reduce duplication of effort um, and often learn about something that's useful across all our projects. Um, Prevent D is looking at um, expansion among patients with diabetes, access is looking at um, cancer, and then the ECHOES is looking at hypertension. Um, so since this fir the first project kicked off in 2015, we've, this, as far as kind of advanced publications, these projects have kind of had the most time to publish. Um, not surprisingly, some of the key findings from these studies, we did see a large drop in uninsured patients in community health centers after the Affordable Care Act um, and disparities in health insurance access for um, racial and ethnic minorities were narrowing. Um, we saw increases in documentation of chronic conditions, um, improvement in cancer screening, and then um, smokers and expansion states at uh, increased odds of quitting as well. So these are, three of those grants are ongoing and so kind of the information that's coming from those studies is continuing on. But um, this is kind of just to, to highlight some of the research that's coming out of the advanced data model. So looking across, across all of our advanced network, across all 27 states that we have available, working in partnership with, um, with both uh, Fenway Health and Health Choice Network. Um, and we are able to also utilize kind of their expertise as far as what we might be seeing within our data to better understand what's going on within their set of clinics as well because 
we, we have clinical expertise within OCHIN, but don't always understand what might be going on within another healthcare kind of system. Um, another study that I'm involved in is called CV Wizard, and um, it is in partnership with Kaiser Center for Health Research. And this is a clinical decision support tool, or a CDS, um, designed for cardiovascular disease risk management. Um, and so it's basically kind of taking all the cardiovascular disease risk data and summarizing it into what kind of one point in one place so a provider can make recommendations for a patient who might be at high risk. And um, it provides both a provider-facing and a patient-facing summary in multiple languages. Um, and it also is hoping to address some of the barriers in using CDS for guideline-based care. Um, so as far as this is our, our fearless leader, Rachel Gold, and her wizarding hat. So the um, clinics that were recruited into this study all received kind of a a guide in terms of how to use this tool. They all received some kickoff training and they've all received um, kind of regular support and webinars and follow-up training um, to answer any questions that might come up in using this tool. Um, and then they're now getting um, monthly reports and how often the CV wizard is being viewed or print and printed. Um, so this is um, kind of a study where we've been able to work with our clinics and work with our clinicians to get additional feedback on how to improve that tool and then also get feedback from our patients using our patient engagement panel on how to improve the patient facing view to make it easier to understand and to read um, and so the first arm has been live for 18 months they've been using that tool and, and kind of this, I don't know how easy it is to see this, but this is the provider view that was kind of first rolled out that patients got to see and it kind of highlighted their lipids and blood pressure and glucose and aspirin or blood thinner use, smoking and BMI. And then it, it provides them a risk score. So the provider sees this 10 year risk score for cardiovascular disease. Um, and kind of highlights, it provides um, a risk reduction score for each of the different components. So this is based on an algorithm that was developed by another partner um, that we are working closely with. So we are able to kind of send our data from the patients that are coming into our clinics out to this other provider, utilize their algorithm, and it comes back to the providers um, so that they can talk to their patients about what to do. So based on a lot of provider feedback, um, the tool has been revised and will be going live, I think, in April. Um, I know it's really fuzzy, but it looks a lot, it looks a lot neater and easier to read. Um, and then similarly, the patient view, the old one kind of gave these alerts if there was, um, for any of the kind of buckets that they might not be doing well on. Um, and the new one is kind of like happy faces and sad faces for things that they could be changing to improve their risk score. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the, this initial wave of clinics, the Armand clinics, have been live for 18 months using this tool. Um, we're in, we've been incorporating those learnings from um, any feedback to improve the tool and then any support that we're providing to the clinics because we're going to be rolling out um, this tool to the second wave of clinics in April and um, it'll include this new revised tool, um, additional learnings that we've gotten and how better to provide support to those clinics so that the providers are better um, equipped and feel better able to use that tool and then starting to work on the analysis plan to look at how well the tool is performed. So as of right now, we don't have any kind of data about how well it's working, um, but soon, hopefully. 
Um, and then another study that I worked on was looking at um, healthcare services for uh, children in foster care. So this was also in partnership with Kaiser Center for Health Research. Um, we utilized both Medicaid claims and OCHIN's data to identify a cohort of foster kids that are seen in our clinics. Um, and it was a quantitative analysis that was done at OCHIN and then a qualitative analysis that Kaiser did. Um, so we identified um, foster kids both through um, kind of patient type within OCHIN's EHR, but then also able to use <coughs> um, Medicaid claims to help identify the, um, provider kids based on an eligibility record. Um, and we, linked, we were able to link those data and we had about 5% of children in Oregon clinics are enrolled in foster care. And I, I can't remember the percent. I know most all foster kids in Oregon were seen in one of OCHIN's community health centers. Um, and then kind of for analysis, we matched them to um, a kind of sample of children that were of similar age and gender and health and seen in the same health center. Um, it was kind of a, it was a four year study period um, for children ages three through seventeen. Um, I kind of think I went over this, but um, we were really interested in looking at service utilization and particularly focused on mental health service utilization among these kids. Um, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Charleston Comorbidity Index. It's, it was originally developed um, by Mary Charleston um, to predict mortality, and it's since been revised and been shown to um, predict a whole bunch of other kind of health outcomes. Um, <coughs> and we are using an enhanced version of the algorithm that includes um, several mental health and behavioral health conditions as well. Um, so basically, the higher the score, the more medically complex the patient is. And maybe not surprisingly, we found that the foster kids that we're seeing are much more medically complex than the comparison group of children that are also being seen in our community health centers. Um, and then as far as kind of the mental health conditions, again, maybe not surprising, the blue is the foster kids. Um, the percent of foster children that are coming in for any mental health condition was a lot higher than um, the other the other children that we were seeing in our clinics. Um, and the the state of Oregon has kind of taken note of um, what has come out of the study and um, wants to work in partnership to as as Oregon's. CPS system has kind of come under some the spotlight in a negative way recently, hoping to kind of work in partnership um, to see what else can be done as far as looking at what's going on with the foster kids and how we can better serve them. So that's kind of an ongoing, continuing thing that we're doing within OCHIN um, and um, working on getting Getting some of the results from these that are under review right now. Um, so as far as kind of additional information that we have on OCHIN research um, and the research projects, they're all on our website. And um, the Advanced Clinic Research Network website also has kind of a very short form of some of the data that's available within OCHIN. Um, that kind of outlines what a, a small subset of what we can look at and what we are looking at as well. Um, and then um, other information on the Cornet as well. So that's kind of what I had for you today to talk about. I don't know if anyone has any questions, but. Uh, can you tell us uh, what uh, are the, you know, what the usual funding sources here? Yes. <laughs> Good question. Um, most all of our studies are R01 funded. 
Um, so mostly NIH, but some are ARC and um, HRSA grants. And um, the foster care study was um, funded by Kaiser's uh, community health grants that they have for researchers in-house. Yeah. Yeah. Great to hear about all the lovely things that OGENS does. I have two questions. Um, for the advanced network, mm -hmm. do you all have Medicare or all payer already linked with that data? No. So I'm most of the data sources that we had linked um, are typically available on a project by project basis as far as kind of availability. Um, and some of them are, so the, the Oregon Medicaid claims data is linked and it gets updated quarterly, mm -hmm. um, but it's not necessarily available for all projects. We get permission for each project that wants to utilize it. Um, and then I, obtaining Medicare claims data is actually an organizational priority, not just the research department priority, but to kind of integrate claims data, Medi Medicare claims data. Um, and again, no, all of that would, it, it's more kind of getting permission to use it after it's been linked is a lot easier than <laughs> newly linking. Uh, in terms of APIC data, so do you allow the, have capacity to link to other data sources? To link to other? Yeah, APAC to other. Have, like, Such like what? Community health centers. And... Like outside of the community health center? Or... No, no, no. APAC data. So... Oh, linking APAC yeah. to something else. Mm -hmm. um, I, so most of our studies, they have to be linked to the kind of community health center mm -hmm. data. Sometimes, like, depending on the study, um, the cancer, cancer registry data, we only have cancer registry data for patients that are seen in um, our community health center clinics. So, so that so my understanding about APIC data, you know, to for the data set to be linked to other data sources we need to be allowed, you know, and get need to get the permission from OHA. Mm -hmm. So whether you know it is also project by project basis to get the permission when you have the universal yeah. permission to do that. Yes. Yeah. Yep, that's basic. Basically how it works, kind of project by project. One more. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't see uh, the, I mean, I, I know there are more, more, you know, kind of more data sources you guys have access to the music than it shows, that slide shows. How about uh, criminal justice data, jail? That's not something that anyone's linked to at this point. Um, Ocean does serve and um, at least three uh, county correctional facilities is, um, and provides the electronic health record system for three county correctional facilities, but doesn't necessarily, we don't have the criminal justice data for those. This is Oregon County. Huh? Oregon County? No, outside of Oregon. Yeah, or, yeah. Yeah. Any quick technical questions mm -hmm. and then a practical question? Mm -hmm. um, have you had an opportunity to look at uh, the data from your network and whether linked with others or not and estimate what proportion of care you're capturing? Mm. <laughs> for these folks, I mean, uh, yeah. you're, you're talking about folks who move frequently and, yeah. and change mm -hmm. providers, but maybe all within here. So I, I don't know if you've had a chance to come up with estimates of what proportion you're capturing. Yeah. That's the technical kind of question. Then the, the practical question <laughs> is you know, collaborating with people from outside of OSHA. You know, all mm -hmm. of us are outside of OSHA. Yep. Probably looking here about so you can come knock on your door, how does that work? Yeah. Um, so as far as um, patients who are returning and what kind of percentage of their care we're capturing, no one has looked, as far as I know, directly at that. But um, 
we're kind of finalizing a paper looking at retention. So seeing how often those patients are coming back because that gets asked a lot. Yeah. Um, and I mean, a lot of, I, it, I believe over 70% of them are coming back multiple years. So we're seeing them over time continuing to come back um, for care. But I, I can't remember the exact numbers on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I know that that is kind of a big question, how much care are they getting outside of the community health centers since it's kind of a finite level of care that they can provide. Um, and so as far as research pro uh, partnerships, almost, I want to say all of, maybe two of our projects are not, we are in collaboration with outside universities um, and other research institutions. So that is something that Ochin does and is used to, and we have now finally kind of, as the research department has matured a little bit more, kind of a better process to help facilitate those partnerships. Um, and, has, and we have kind of uh, coordinators to help kind of people move through that process, but I'm happy to help answer questions too. If people have questions, or put you in touch with somebody. If, yeah. There's. Can you say a little bit about the question that was just asked about me thinking about how much the people who are getting care in the CHCs are engaged? Like, do they know they're part of this network? Are there consent processes for mm. them <laughs> so that they're enrolled, or is it all observational, non consented So, when research at Ochin started, I think we had to go and get permission from each clinic for every study to use their data. And now when an uh, organization comes onto Ochin's network, they can opt out, but they are that is kind of part of being part of the Ochin member organization. And I'm not 100% sure how they let their patients know that they're part of that network. I'm sure, I mean, a lot of us at our health clinic get forms that we don't read and then <laughs> might be some part of that form that, um, but I mean, I don't, as far as other claims data or other data that's kind of being utilized for research, I don't know what consent process is happening from people who are receiving care. Often though. Yeah. I mean, so that's, that's when you were talking yeah. about patients kind of coming on and off. It's one thing to be enrolled in Medicaid, which right. is an active process. It's another thing to be getting care mm -hmm. in a community health center. Yes. Yep. Or going someplace else where you may or may not be mm -hmm. able to see the data. So mm -hmm. for example, I think of you know people who are getting community health care, they might be going to the county hospital as opposed to getting care under Medicaid. Mm -hmm. so do, can you see, that's what I'm wondering is, how much can you see, like if you followed a patient for two years, mm -hmm. what kind of gaps do you, do you have? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, I guess it's hard to say. I don't know that anyone's looked at, like, kind of linking up Medicaid to see how many kind of instances of care are getting captured within the community health center versus being captured elsewhere. but. Um, I think it's definitely an important thing to be thinking about, but that, I mean, we are seeing a lot of these patients coming back over time, and we are seeing a lot of these patients continuing to receive usual care in these, in these centers. Um, but what we're missing, I think, with any, any of these kind of data sources remains unknown. I think kind of the, the strength of the OCHIN data that a lot of other sources are missing is that we are capturing what's happening with our uninsured patients. And a lot of that claims data is just, we don't know what they're doing. Um, let's start. So, uh, especially, so what, can you elaborate on the benefits that the providers get by being in your network? And are there other networks like Ocean that uh, people don't get? Um, so the benefits the providers get? Um, as far as kind of benefits, it's 
providing learning opportunities that if they are engaged in research, then we do either compensate the clinic or, and or sometimes the provider, depending on the research question um, and the engagement of the provider as well. Um, but or OCHIN hosts kind of an annual learning forum for our clinics to come and learn from each other and hosts a lot of other kind of learning opportunities for the clinics to learn from each other. Um, so I guess that's kind of the opportunities that they get. And then what was your other question? Will I ever take this? I mean, who's... Oh, other companies. Um, so I mentioned as part of um, the advanced network, uh, Health Choice Network out of Florida, provides a sort of similar service. Um, they don't have a research department that's um, part of that group. They are maybe thinking about establishing one. Um, so sometimes working with them can be challenging, just working with kind of the tech people, understanding what's going on can be, can be a challenge. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the only other organization that really kind of does what OGEN does. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for, yeah. for coming today. I think the the partnership that you've made with the Bob Graham Center mm. is super interesting. Yeah. And there are a lot of questions about you know place and mm -hmm. health, and so I'm curious to know what you have brewing there, and if there are particular variables maybe that people are using more frequently, or um, just any uh, just any more detail you know on that. Um, it's, it's still a newer thing. I think uh, at this point a lot of people have been looking at the social deprivation index um, as kind of a measure, just kind of rough estimate of what's going on. Um, but I know some of the other studies are kind of starting to explore some other, other components of what's available within that um, for, because of yeah, the context and trying to understand that a little bit better. Yeah. I think too about like that. Is it Edna that has the healthy cities? Healthy. There feel like oh. there are a couple of. Uh -huh. Anyway, so I, I I did meet Rachel as part of oh. the National Academy since and she okay. my name's Allison. She told me to to reach oh. out to you. <laughs> Six months ago, so I'll I'll get there. Okay. <laughs> but but um but yeah, those kinds of things like I think where the clinic data meets the place data can be really important for for a lot of public health questions. Uh huh. And, um, yeah. That's a neat area for exploration. Yeah, definitely. Rachel does a lot of our social determinants of health research um, and leads that portfolio. Um, she has a joint appointment at Kaiser and at Ochen, but is also kind of a national voice in that research and in that field. Um, yeah, she's great to work with. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Yeah. And uh, from the uh, examples that you uh, just presented to us. Uh -huh. Since that, uh, uh, none of this research, uh, probably that I missed this part, but none of the research uh, has ever studied any like uh, healthcare expenditures or cost. So is it just because the samples that you, uh, the examples that you selected to present, or is it because that, uh, this data do not have any like that kind of variables? Yeah, right now we don't have cost data in our HR system available. Um, one study that used linked Medicare or Medicaid data looked at expenditures because they had that available to them. But as far as you know, specific doge, and we don't have that so right now. Like a payment of costs or, or, or uh, this kind of variables are not known. Um, not for the research side at oh. this point, but that might change. I know that that's something that's been of interest. Yeah. So because what I understand is that that is the key services that you what the, the like the building services and uh, help the um, well I guess I mean Ocean really kind of started to provide this tool Epic to the health centers and kind of everything that went along with using that tool so I mean I think a lot of times people think of Ocean as a health IT company but billing is a part of that now but not all of the community health centers that we serve use our billing services yeah uh, my second question is that uh, what is the percentage of the uh, those safety net index or like uh, community health centers in Oregon uh, join this data? Specific to Oregon, I know I saw that number somewhere at one point, and I I can't tell you exactly. I know most of them in Oregon. Yeah. 
um, outside of Oregon, it's a much smaller percentage, but still um, at least representative of the national kind of community health center population. Yeah. My third question is that, uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I would like to know more about the data allocation mechanisms. So the like, data what? The, uh, how, how can we uh, mm. apply for this data, for example, just like apply to OJ to get uh, mm -hmm. data, or is it that we, we need to uh, reach out to OCHIN to collaborate with you so that we can study your data? Yeah, so um, we we don't ever just hand over data like OHA does because we understand there are a lot of nuances and other pieces that researchers might not understand. So we work in partnership and kind of the level of that partnership depends on the study um, and kind of what gets agreed upon. But um, we always have a team within OCHIN that is kind of a part of whatever study, so often as a sub-awardee on a grant, um, and then kind of deciding on, again, kind of what level um, of involvement OCHIN has. So whether we're doing all of the analysis, some of the analysis, none of the analysis, or simply providing data for doing tool builds and working with the clinics, that becomes much more involved as far as what OCHEN is doing in terms of recruiting clinics and maintaining those partnerships. Um, but the data only studies, I think, have a lot more variability as far as OCHEN's involvement. Yeah. If you don't mind, I actually have like a four questions. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. This question is kind of like minor. Uh -huh. uh, do you list like the priority like, uh -huh. on your research agendas? Yeah. Some, some of those like uh, condition, medical conditions in this. Uh -huh. uh, who, who generated this kind of like the research priority? Is it from OCHEN or is it from like the, those like the collaborated like community health centers give you this, this is our priority or from mm -hmm. providers or from your patient panel? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think it kind of comes, I am not 100% sure, but I think it comes in kind of partnership from feedback from our clinics in terms of their priority areas, um, along with um, kind of the, um, our board. And our, many of our board member, members are also um, either clinicians in some of the community health centers or involved in other ways in kind of the community health center network. Um, so identifying kind of those priority areas based on the vision and mission of OCHIN as a whole. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So has anybody done any studies looking at the access to care of um, this that's uh, provided to community health center patients outside, you know, like surgery or other procedures that the health center can't do itself? Um, so as far as like the inpatient care that the... Is Either inpatient or, or outpatient, outpatient but yeah. yeah, specialty care that is not provided by the centers. Um, not really. I think, I know that some studies have utilized the Medicaid inpatient data file, but I don't think they, it's really kind of looked specifically at that question. Yeah. I know that, that's a challenge for a lot of, you know, patients seen in a community health center, they need a specialty procedure, they're yes. not insured. They... Yep. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I think that's an important question to be asking for these patients. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally uh, unrelated uh -huh. to the presentation. Okay. <laughs> you know, you, so you've been with um, Ochin two years, right? Almost, yeah. yeah. Almost two years. And as so I see our doctor students here, uh -huh. most of them are presentation <laughs> on the stage. Uh -huh. Do you have a recommendation for them? <laughs> a recommendation <laughs> as far as what? A suggestion. <laughs> For, writing their for, for finishing, don't take a job before you finish. <laughs> I think I overlapped about six months. That was rough. Um, she was warned. Huh? I was warned. Yes, I was warned. Um, yeah. Um, any recommendations? Advice. I don't know. That's a hard question. I feel like everyone's so unique as far as kind of where they're looking to go and what they're looking and to do. Please let me revise my question. Okay. <laughs> um, I 
So as, as a, you know, someone trained in, you know, research, uh -huh. research, research, policy research, mm -hmm. so what do you think of the strength and limitations of our public health program, training programs? Training programs. Hmm. That would be us. Uh -huh. <laughs> Put on the spot here. <laughs> I have my and degree. So that you, you know, yeah. You, you learn from your real life working experience. And do you see any areas of improvement for faculty? I mean, I, in all honesty, I feel like my work um, as a research assistant on the studies I was involved in, I feel very prepared and equipped to kind of come into this job. Um, and I mean, that doesn't speak to trying to learn SAS and SQL and the 18,000 tables and EPIC that I, <laughs> I'm still trying to learn, but um, I think my training kind of outside of the classroom was really valuable. Um, and having those opportunities for myself. Um, yeah, I think some of the, the classroom experience was, was great, but that was kind of really where I feel like I was able to, to kind of transition without feeling like it was a, this is a totally new thing for me. So I think we can take it as advice for students too. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Well, I would definitely love. Okay, I would love to talk to any of you or answer.